Good morning. Good morning. As you know, this is the third sermon in our series, our sermon series called Works Versus Faith. Uh, we'll wrap up, actually, next week, uh, we'll wrap up our discussion uh, of, of this, uh, talking about actually the place of works, if you will. But for today, we're just going to continue on focusing on faith. And, and the importance of faith and God's grace uh, as, uh, as we've been looking. If you would, uh, let's share some reverence for God's word, his holy word today. Let's, let's stand just for a moment. We have one verse to read. And actually, if you found Titus chapter 3, verse 5, as printed in your bulletins, uh, please feel free to read it out loud with me. If you need more time, just say amen. Okay. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, I thank you so much for this beautiful day, for those who have gathered here, for for all that you've been doing. We thank you, Father, that you have indeed been here. Your presence has been felt, and we just praise you. We thank you for that. We ask, Lord, that you would move mightily, even now. Speak through your speaker. Move me out of the way and have your way in this place today. I just praise you, God, for what you're about to do. Bring forth, God, a word that will, will encourage us in our daily walk and help us to share your love with this lost and dying world. In Jesus' precious holy name, amen. 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 You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Well, this morning, as I mentioned, and actually we're moving now into the afternoon hour, uh, the, I, I want to turn your attention for just a moment to a, a figure that is probably well known to you. Uh, that would be uh, the late Dr. Martin Luther, not uh, Martin Luther King Jr., who, with whom we have, or for whom we have great respect as well, but for the reformer uh, that we know as Martin Luther. He, as you may know, was a Catholic priest who nailed to the door of the Wittenberg Church, the castle church, where he was actually the, the vicar. Uh, he nailed to the door of this castle church at Wittenborg what we know as the 95 Theses. They were, there were indeed uh, 95 little sentence, usually a sentence, maybe two sentence long statements that basically brought great indictment on the religious leadership uh, that was prevailing in the in his day. Uh, that was uh, the the Catholic Church, as it were. He saw a great many abuses, a great many a great deal of corruption, and he he boldly uh, we 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 picture in our mind that he boldly did this, but actually this was done in the wee hours of the morning on October thirty first of fifteen seventeen. He nailed it to the door of the church, and it was written in Latin so as not to be understood by the common people. This was not to be something, his intention was not to actually bring some great uh, widespread public uh, popular upheaval, but indeed his intention was to have a scholarly debate with the bishops and archbishops so as to help to restore what he saw as a church that had lost its way. So we think about him as being a, the great reformer, if you will, and yet he was one of many. But he did, in fact, boldly stand a few years, three and a half years, just about, give or take, April 18th, I believe it was, 1521, he stood before the Diet of Worms and had to answer the question, will you recant? These are your writings. 
will you recant? You see, what happened instead of instead of having this quiet scholarly debate, somehow someone got a hold of those 95 theses, translated them into German, it hit the printing press, and it became an overnight sensation. It was, it was if you will, in, in our time, it would be like the number one New York Times bestseller. It was widespread. He had, put, he had started a fire that he could not put out. And in fact, he, there, was a, there was a papal bull issued where he was told, look, you have to recant this or face excommunication. You have so many days to respond. Instead, he stood in the square, the town square, on the day that it, his response was due and burned the letter publicly. He did, in fact, become emboldened. He stood, and then I'd like to read to you his words. Uh, he, he was asked to re if he would be willing to recant his writings, and he said, quote, Unless I can be instructed and convinced with evidence from the Holy Scriptures or with open, clear, and distinct grounds of reasoning, then I cannot and will not recant, because it is neither safe nor wise to act against unconscious uh, uh, against conscience and 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 here's the here's the quote that that gives all of us you know we those of us who know it we we kind of stand a little taller maybe when this part or sit a little taller sit a little straighter uh, when this part comes on when if it's portrayed in a movie here I stand I can do no other God help me amen and, and, and just, just thinking about it, you know, uh, oh, you know, here he is standing up there. And, and let's face it, the truth of the matter is that this was, these were exceptionally bold words. He faced not only the, the branding of being called a heretic, and like John, Jan Hus earlier, he, he could have been put to death for his heresy, what, what, the, what the church saw as heresy. But then, too, it was creating some upheaval, and the, the emperor of Rome, the new Ro Holy Roman Emperor, if you will, he was also represented in this diet of worms and he could have put him to death civilly for creating an upheaval. Luckily, not really luckily, because I don't believe in luck, but thankfully God made a way and uh, Luther uh, was able to leave and to continue teaching. Uh, this, this revolutionary reverend gave us the doctrines, the, the five solas, if you will, Sola Fide, Sola Scriptura, Sola Gratia, uh, Solus Christus, and uh, Soli Deo Gloria. Now, these in Latin, uh, we, we, like I said, we call them the five solas, but Sola Fide, faith alone, only faith, Sola Fide. Sola Scriptura only scripture, scripture alone, sola gratia, grace alone, solus Christus, Christ alone, soli deu, deo gloria, to God alone, glory, or glory to God alone. We, 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 we see him being more the, the sola fide, that is, that is really the, the big thing for him because it is the doctrine of justification by faith. Now, let me ask you this. Let me, let me stop and pause in the story for just a second. Let me ask you if you were able to work your way back to God. In other words, if you were able to do enough good deeds to earn your way back into fellowship, communion with God, would you? I'm not asking you 
to answer that right now, but answer that in your heart. If you could work your way back to God, you know, I'm reminded of the old song, I, I forget who did it, but I'm working my way back to you, babe. Okay, sorry, I shouldn't dance like that. But the, but the thing is, would you? Would you work your way back to God if you could? And now here's the thing. See, I ask this because this same man who became the father of, of a great revival, a great upheaval, a, a, a great reformation, he used to be a monk. In fact, uh, he was what I would call a super monk, if you will. He, he didn't, well, he put it this way. My situation was that although an impeccable monk, I stood before God as a sinner troubled in conscience, and I had no confidence that my merit would assuage him. Night and day I pondered until I saw the connection between the justice of God and the statement that the just shall live by his faith. You see, before this, he, was, he, he would say, he, you know, if anyone could be saved by monkery, it was him. He was, uh, he, he was ascetic to the bone. Uh, ascetic meaning uh, willing to uh, dedicate himself fully he would he would punish himself if he sinned. This was a man who, you know, we we say grace before we eat our our, our meals. We thank God for the for the blessing that he has given us, the provision for the food, and we ask him to bless that food for the nourishment of our bodies. But <clears throat> this man would would go to the point that let's say he was eating a bowl of porridge and he would he would pray over the porridge and thank you God for the porridge and so on and and, and let's say that he sloshed a little dollop of it out of the bowl and he would pray over the little dollop a separate prayer and this was a man who would <clears throat> would pray constantly he would he would uh, kneel on every step of the cathedral going up to, uh, to the tower, uh, praying on each various step, on his knees. This was a man who was sold out to God. And yet, he was doing all of this with the intention of working his way back to God. And that's why I asked the question, would you work your way back to God if you could. You, you see, we see that, that in his study of Romans chapter 1, it was our scripture of meditation this morning, we, we read it out loud. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for all who believe, right? Or power of, uh, right, of God uh, to salvation for everyone who believes. That's it. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. Well, the Greek, that means anyone who is not Jew. The Gentile, if you will. For it is, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The just shall live by faith. Abraham was called a friend of God. But see, he believed and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Jesus was asked, what shall we, we want to do the works of God. What, what should we do to do the works of God? He said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Believe and live. But what of 
one of these good works. As I said, next week we're going to look at the second chapter of James. James is one of my favorite uh, chapters, uh, favorite books in the Bible. James tells it straight. He does not pull punches. Uh, someone said that he uh, that the epistle of James was a right strawy epistle, meaning that it was it was uh, very much bare bones. It was right down to earth, and yet he didn't sugarcoat anything. It was without much flavor. It was bland, if you will. But I like James because James just gives it to you straight. And next week we'll talk about how faith without works is dead. But how does that square with what we're doing today? Not by works of righteousness, Paul writes to Titus. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you have looked at this verse, you know that this actually comes in the middle of a sentence. It does not, uh, it, do, it is not the beginning of, of this thought, nor is it the end of this thought. You see, it, it, it not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, comma, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, comma, still continuing the thought, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life, period. End of thought. But what about the beginning? That gives you to the end of the thought. The end of the thought is, not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy he saved us, Eventually, we get to the point where it says that we have been justified by grace, by his grace. We should become joint heirs, heirs according to the hope of eternal life. But how does that square? Where's the beginning of this thought? Well, we move to the fourth verse, and it says, but, and this is the beginning of the sentence, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done. So again, how does this fit? But means that there's another thought preceding it that is relevant. For we ourselves, verse 3 says, for we ourselves were once fo also foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But, so in other words, things have changed. These things, this, this was your condition. But now, when the kindness of, and love of God, our Savior, toward men appeared, then what? Then, of course, we jump into not by works of righteousness. The fact is, that to get the full context, I would, I would definitely encourage you to read the entire chapter. But, but if you begin at the first verse, remind them. Who's them? Well, we go a little bit further back, don't we? We have to. Uh, again, folks, I, I want you to be able to understand what it is that we believe. I don't want you to take anything out of context or anything for granted. But the fact is that we serve an almighty Savior who has done all the work for us that's needed for our salvation. You see, in the, in, I mentioned the, the solas, the five solas, and, and, and I looked and I was pleasantly surprised that many websites have pretty good information about these solas, but, but it did say that those who, those who were of the Reformed Theological School were more seem like they want to say that they're more entitled to sola gratia, uh, grace alone. You see, many of the Reformed theologians will tell you, and, and, and the buzzword today is those Calvinist theologians, they would tell you that, that God's grace was what drew you to him. That it was his grace that... that empowered you to 
come to him. Actually, they would say that his grace saved you because of his grace. He saved you whether you wanted it or not. They won't put it that way, but, but the logical extension of that thinking is that God will save whom he will by whatever means he will, and it has nothing to do with your will. I have a problem with that. The Word of God tells us God is not a man who can lie, but God is not a man who can, who can or will take you by force and make you his own. He made you for fellowship. He made you so that you would have the opportunity to be in fellowship with him. He wants to have fellowship with you. He loves you. And yet, your sin separates yourself from him and him from you. Now, if our sin could separate us from him, then it no longer becomes... Uh, God is still sovereign, don't get me wrong, but if something we do can keep us from God, then doesn't it make sense that when he did what he did to bring us to him, when he offered his son Jesus on the cross to die for us, when, when, when Jesus became as a whole burnt offering, if you will, then how, we, we look at that, I look at that and I say, how could anyone reject that wonderful gift? that Jesus gave us. How could anyone look at that and see anything other than love? And yet we live in a world where Christophobia, if you will, is the only bigotry that's accepted anymore. I don't think any form of bigotry should be accepted. I don't believe we need to be Islamophobic. I don't believe we need to be heter uh, homophobic. I don't believe we need to be phobic about anything. What can man do to us? The fact is that God died for you. And so the reason I ask the question, if you could work your way back to God, would you? I flatly say no, I would not. No, I could not. Because if I could work my way back to God, if my works of righteousness, which I've done, could in any way earn my salvation, then Jesus didn't have to die. And God made a mistake. And by definition, at least in my heart and from my Bible, God is perfect. He doesn't make mistakes. So if I could work my way back to God, I would be working my way back to a false god, wouldn't I? Yeah. Wouldn't you? No, I would not work my way back to God. I cannot work my way back to God. Every religion in the world, uh, propaganda, Jason Petty, I believe is his real name, he said it well. He said, every religion in the world recognizes that there's something wrong with man. That we, each of us, have messed up. We recognize that that's sin. And the fact is, folks, that even once you're saved, you're still going to sin. John 1 tells, uh, John, John in, uh, 1 John in his epistle, he, he tells us that, that no, you, 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 if you say you haven't sinned, you're lying. You're making God out to be a liar. But he goes on to tell us that if we've sinned, when we've sinned, that if we confess our sin to God, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. See, the, the question, the question is, how good, how many good works do you have to do? Why do we do good works? We'll talk about that next week. But we know that 
as we talked about last week. We're saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We know that, that we have to, we have to take seriously the offer that Christ gives us. He died for us. Those who hold on to the sola gratia, meaning that it's only uh, the only grace, that it's a monergistic thing, a one-way thing, that God did it all, and that we have no part in it. That I understand that thinking. We want to magnify God's sovereignty. We want to lift Him up. We need to lift Him up, but we need to recognize that God gave us an offer that yes he gave us the power to accept through grace but he also gave us the power to reject and that's where the reformed theologian and what's typically called the Arminian differ but you see I have no problem believing that that as the Calvinists do that that we are completely without hope that we are totally depraved and that it's only God's grace that uh, once God's grace has been poured out on us and we are we have a, a part of us that's been activated that we can accept God's gracious offer of salvation I, I can agree with that and I can agree that once you're saved you're always saved because they call it the perseverance of the believer because they, the scriptures teach that if you believe you have eternal life and if eternal life can be revoked, if there's an expiration on it, it's not eternal anymore. Jesus said, those who are mine cannot be taken out of my hand and they cannot be snatched away from me. So, no, none that come to Christ in faith will be lost. No. But the question is, does God give you a choice, or is he going to drag you kicking and screaming into heaven? And because I'm a Baptist, I'm a Christian first, Christian being the, the noun, Baptist being the adjective, I know from Scripture, because we are people of scripture that no God gives us a choice he doesn't want anyone to perish he's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance and if that's true as the Bible teaches that it is then those who hold on to that reformed theology those who would say that God created some to be destroyed in hell they have to answer for what, what do you do with Second Peter? But for now, remember, it's not by works of righteousness which we've done. I, I know that immediately, those immediately under the sound of my voice have made a profession of faith. They're baptized, born-again believers in Jesus. And I know that any good works that they do will be an outward expression of what's already been done internally. And, but we'll talk about that more next week. But for those who are watching on YouTube, I want to encourage you. You cannot work your way back to God. You need, you need a Savior. Jesus is that Savior. He's the only one. He lived a perfect life because none of us could. He lived a perfect life because He's perfect. But none of us could live a perfect life. He offered Himself up as the sacrificial lamb without spot or blemish on our behalf so that if you would accept what he did for you if you would trust that what he did was sufficient to wipe away your sins then you will have eternal life it is that simple faith I'm asking you to exercise your faith In just a moment, we're going to have a, a, here a, a moment of invitation. But I would invite you, if you're watching on YouTube, to please 
write us, respond, post something in the comments section, whatever you need to do, let us know what's God doing in your life. If you have questions, I welcome those. If you have criticisms, I welcome them as well. But I would ask that you would take the time to respond, either through email at Charles Fuller, uh, Charles at Charles Fuller, uh, rather, uh, Charles at Living Hope Baptist Church dot net, um, or you could you can we have a new email, uh, Charles at lhbcva dot com, lhbcva dot com is going to be our new website. Uh, it's in progress, so don't you, know, you can check it out. But but I would encourage you to take the time to respond one way or another. Let us know what God is doing in you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful day, and again, Father, for your word. And we ask, Father, that you would move in the hearts and minds of those who are watching and, and uh, those of us who are here present, God. And we ask that you would help us, Lord, even now. Help us to, those of us who are in Christ, help us to live in such a way that others would see a difference in us something that separates us from others, that sets us apart, that shows your glory. And Father, for those who are watching that may not yet know you, may not yet have a, a saving faith, a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, I ask God that you would move in their hearts and in their minds, that you would draw them to you, and that you would help them to come to you by faith. Lord, maybe they could pray something uh, like this. God, I know I'm a sinner and I know that I need a Savior. And I thank you that Jesus died for me. I thank you, God, that you have made the way, you've provided the way for me to come back to you. And so, Father, I turn from my sin. And I come running to you, and I ask, God, that you would welcome me in your loving arms, that you would save me, and that you would sanctify me. In Jesus' precious holy name. And so, Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for, for those who will accept you, that those who will come to faith. Uh, and we ask, Father, that you would bless them mightily. Help us to come alongside them as they let themselves be known to us. We thank you, Father, again for all that you've done here and all that you're about to do in the lives of those that this will touch and, and those that we will be touching. Give us the right words to speak. Help us to live lives that will be glorifying to you. In Jesus' precious holy name, amen.